Hey, Lighthouse Fort George. My name is Dan. I'm glad to be with you again this weekend. Would you bow with me in prayer as we come to God's Word? Heavenly Father, uh, thank you that you love us. Uh, oh, that you gather here with us, that you send your Spirit to, to unify and bind your church together. Uh, we need that right now. Uh, we're so separated by uh, this uh, COVID situation we find ourselves in, uh, being locked down, uh, all uh, separated. Uh, some of us are together with maybe one or two other people or maybe our family, but other than that, Lord, we miss each other, and, and so we desperately need your Spirit to come and to, to unify us by your power. So come, Holy Spirit, move in this place. Uh, Move in me now as I speak, and I pray that you would move in us, that you'd prepare us for what it is you want to say to your church. Come, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. When most people are asked to describe Jesus, uh, the one word that comes up more than anything else, uh, you can probably guess it, is love. And uh, of course, uh, Jesus was constantly uh, helping people who couldn't help themselves. He uh, was committed to nonviolence. His teachings were all about uh, elevating uh, all people as equals before God. And, and so actually, love is, is a great word to describe Jesus, especially when you couple this with the fact that he gave up his own life to, to die for the sins of humanity. Uh, we just really easily see how Jesus could fit into a rubric like that. The problem is that our culture's ideas about love have grown mushy. There's no longer any room in love for a challenge or correction or even a difference of opinion. That's not love, that's hate now. And so uh, painting Jesus with uh, today's uh, love brush, if you would, would require that his edges would be rubbed off. And of course, uh, anytime we're doing this to Jesus, when we're, when we're tweaking him to fit with uh, something that works more for us in our culture, uh, what we're doing is we're creating him in our own image. And this is the Jesus that we're comfortable with. And of course, this kind of Jesus is powerless to save. And so the real Jesus that Mark has been introducing to us is the one that we need. And uh, this Jesus was raw and edgy. Uh, He was offensive and challenging to the world that he walked into. Like uh, people just got caught off guard by him. Uh, He said things and did things that they totally didn't expect. They weren't comfortable with. And as a result, if you asked Mark to describe Jesus with one word, he wouldn't choose the word love. He'd choose the word authority. We bump into that Jesus today. So uh, please uh, grab your Bible, follow along if you will. We're in Mark chapter 1 starting in verse 21. And uh, as you're turning there, would you stand with me as we come before God's Word? This is the Word of the Lord. So Mark chapter 1 starting in verse 21 going down to 34. Hear now the Word of the Lord. They, this is Jesus and his disciples, went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came... Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told her about Jesus uh, told Jesus about her and so he went to her took her by the hand and helped her up the fever left her and she began to wait on them that evening after sunset the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed the whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases he also drove out many demons but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was This is the word of the Lord. You can go ahead and sit down. 
So in today's text, the rightful king demonstrates his authority, and he does this, he shows that he has authority over all of life because he built this place. And so as king, he wants to lead us now on this new exodus journey into the new kingdom that he has for us. So last week, we looked a little bit at this kingdom that Jesus inaugurated, and we saw that it's totally different than any kingdom uh, that anybody in his uh, day, that his first listeners would have expected. But it also isn't anything like any kingdom that we might expect today. So it's not a conservative kingdom. It's not a liberal kingdom. It's not even anywhere in the middle. Instead, the kingdom that Jesus uh, was setting in motion was a restoration of something that had been missing in creation since Adam decided to try his own hand at being king, king of the garden. Of course, that didn't work out too good, but that was last week. And so this week, Jesus steps now away from that general introduction about kingdom into Sabbath. And so in verse 21, Jesus heads into the synagogue on the Sabbath and begins to teach. Now, wasn't it all surprising that a traveling rabbi, and Jesus was this, uh, would be given opportunities to teach? This was very much part of the culture. But it isn't coincidental that this is the first thing that Jesus does in his ministry, and that is start to teach on Sabbath. Sabbath is central to Jesus' identity. And so, uh, Sabbath in Jewish tradition is the seventh day of the week. Uh, It's Saturday, it's a day of rest, and it's uh, uh, also, uh, it's both a command and a gift from God. And so uh, through Moses, God told his people, and this is actually the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments, he said this, you have six days each week to do your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That's why the Lord blessed the seventh day and set it apart as holy. Now, to understand Sabbath, we need to make two connections. And the first is between Sabbath and creation. And the second is between Sabbath and the Exodus. So first, a Sabbath was designed to keep God's people coming back to creation. And this is uh, explicit, really, in the Ten Commandments. So uh, God explains, we just read this, that the reason his people are supposed to rest on the Sabbath. He just tells them what the reason is, and it's because God rested on the seventh day of creation. And so Sabbath is meant to be a blessing, a creation blessing for God's people, and it's a gift. And it's part of the gift, or, or really the central part of the gift, was reminding us of the time when humanity was living with God in his perfect kingdom, and he was king. And this is before we decided we wanted to be king. And this is the way that God designed life to be, and it included rest. Now, don't miss the significance here. Rest isn't some frivolous, optional aspect of God's kingdom. The Ten Commandments aren't uh, like guidelines in a pirate's code, right? So they're the requirements God set for being part of his kingdom. God says, if you want me to be your king, then you need to follow these rules. It's not optional. We're not negotiating. This is the deal. And then Jesus shows up. And a ton of his ministry is all about Sabbath. All of it happens on the Sabbath. You ever notice that? You read through the Gospels? Uh, The majority of what Jesus does happens on the Sabbath. Uh, More than any other day, it's always the Sabbath. And of course, this causes all sorts of trouble because the Pharisees thought that Jesus is disobeying God's law. Uh, They think that he's not following God's rules with the stuff that he does on the Sabbath. But but this isn't true at all. Uh, Jesus did follow Sabbath. He loves Sabbath. But he loved it the way God had designed it to be, not the way religious people were observing it. So Sabbath day for Jesus was a day of rest dedicated to Yahweh. That's specific in the Ten Commandments. 
It's not a day dedicated to human tradition or religion, whatever that might be. So once uh, after he was attacked for healing someone on the Sabbath, he does this big miracle. The guy's healed. The Pharisees come to him. Uh, They're saying, hey, you don't follow God, right? You're doing all this bad stuff on the Sabbath. Jesus says this, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? Like, what am I supposed to do on the Sabbath? Is it a day to save life or destroy it? Sabbath for Jesus was about doing what God does. It's about setting people free. Now, following Jesus' example, Sabbath uh, observance changed for Christians. And the early Jesus followers, uh, there's this massive transition uh, from following the Sabbath, the Saturday, to beginning to observe Sunday. And so these early Jesus followers emphasized, hey, it's not about the rules, it's about the intention. We've got to get to God's heart behind the law. And this means, for example, it doesn't matter what day you observe this, as long as you observe it. And so Christians worshiped on Sunday because this is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. But hear this. In Jesus' kingdom, rest and Sabbath are still central. So God built this place because he loves us. He wants a relationship with us. That's what Sabbath is about. And so just because Sabbath isn't law doesn't mean we don't do it. In fact, uh, people who understand how much God loves us, Christians who understand this, love to Sabbath because we can. Not because we have to, but because we have freedom to. So ask yourself, what does the way that I Sabbath demonstrate about my understanding of how much God loves me? My Sabbath is connected to my understanding of how much God loves me. So what am I in the practice of doing that that refocuses myself on my creator? I guess another question we could ask ourselves is, is it working? So is what I'm doing helping me live in the relationship with God that I was created for? Or really, are, are my own ideas about Sabbath and rest, are they really just centering about me and my comfort? Not the same thing. Sabbath. Sabbath is about getting back to the God of the garden. That's not the only thing that Sabbath is about. And so Sabbath is also about redemption. And we get this uh, in the connection to Exodus. And so God gave Israel Sabbath uh, uh, through Moses just after he'd brought them out of Egypt. And and Sabbath is actually one of the central ways that differentiates a life, this new life that Israel was walking into, life under King Yahweh as opposed to life under King Pharaoh. Not the same thing. And so in Egypt, there's no, no time for a day of rest. Slaves don't have that luxury. But God's design for humanity isn't slavery. It's freedom. Ironically, when we choose to be our own kings, then, then we sold ourselves into slavery. And that's why God has to redeem his people. So he has to buy his people back out of slavery, the slavery that they'd put themselves into. Redemption. Now, there's two groups of enslaved people in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus interacts with. And so uh, one group is enslaved by sin. We're going to see people like this. And the other group is enslaved by legalism. And these two groups look totally different on the outside. Uh, People around them view these groups totally differently. In fact, they don't even see one of the groups as enslaved at all. But Jesus does. Jesus actually sees them very similarly. He sees them both as people who are trapped outside of God's kingdom. So notice then, in this text, how Jesus walks into the synagogue on the Sabbath. And it's there that he's confronted by this demon-possessed man. Now, the synagogue was the official turf of the Pharisees. This is where they hung out all the time. They ruled this place. They were the bosses in the synagogue. And these guys are absolutely concerned with holiness. This is their turf. But here's this crazy thing. As Jesus is teaching in the middle of this space run by all these people concerned with purity and holiness, verse 23 says there's this man with an impure spirit who starts causing trouble. Impure spirit. This is actually a very, very specific way of speaking about this situation. So here, impure means ceremonially defiled. 
In other words, not worthy to be in the synagogue. And yet there he is. He's right there in the Pharisees' stomping ground. And the Pharisees' stomping ground is full of impurity. And this means that these men who are outwardly doing everything that God commanded were actually inwardly far from God. So these are the leaders, and yet the people in their midst are enslaved with these impure spirits, right? So, so that means that the, the Pharisees themselves are enslaved, and as a result, they're not able to free the people that they're leading from their own slavery. See these two groups of people? One pe- group that, that nobody thought was enslaved but actually were, and this other group that everybody could have seen as enslaved. And so as Jesus begins to teach in the synagogue, all of a sudden there's this fresh wind that blows into the synagogue. People are amazed by it right away. They recognize there's something totally different about Jesus, and they say he's got real authority. Authority. Authority is this big word that Mark is going to use throughout the gospel to sum Jesus up. And so we get it here in verse 22. We get it again in verse 27. And actually, really everything that Jesus does exudes authority. So when he teaches and when he heals and when he exercises demons, it's all with authority. Now, there are two different kinds of authority. So uh, the first kind of authority that we talk about is people who are authorities on a subject. And so, for example, if you're a university student, uh, you're sitting under a professor and, and she's studied this particular topic for years and years and years and years and years, and so she's the authority on the topic. I had a professor named uh, Craig Evans at Trinity Western University, uh, and he was an authority on first century um, Israel. And he, his lectures consisted of him telling stories of stuff that's going on. So, oh, King Herod did this, blah, blah, blah. And it was just like he was there. It was amazing to sit under his teaching because uh, he was an authority on the first century. It was awesome. That's the first kind of authority. The second kind of authority isn't attached to what you know, but the position that you hold. And this is the authority uh, to rule that kings and governments yield. And so here's the thing. The Greek word in this text actually refers to this second kind of authority, not the first. So Jesus taught not just like he knew what he was talking about, though he did, but he taught like he was in charge. Now, get your head around that for a second. We all think that's happy as long as we're talking about Jesus, but just imagine that you bumped into someone at university or at church who was teaching like they were in charge. What would that look like? Can you, can you imagine that? So what would they say? What would they sound like? Would you be drawn to this person or repulsed by them? What kind of words would you use to describe this kind of person who's teaching as though they're in charge. How about arrogant or cocky or overconfident? We, we hate people like this. We naturally, something just puts us on edge when we encounter this and we try to oppose these people. When people appear like they think they're in charge, we try to oppose them. And so uh, right now in culture, uh, there are all sorts of movements uh, going on aimed at opposing this kind of authority. So, uh, for example, uh, the movement to defund the police. There's, there's things going on about that in culture. Uh, expunging political leaders from history. Uh, defaming uh, Christian influence in society. All this is going on uh, out in the world. And, and the tool actually that's being used to accomplish this is the exposure of corruption. Right? And so the message is clear. When people have this kind of authority, they abuse it and they hurt the people around them. That's what's going on. When there's this kind of authority, it hurts the people around them. Now here's the crazy thing. Here's the amazing thing. People are amazed when they encounter Jesus. They don't react like this, even though he's teaching like he's in charge. Why? Well, that's because there's something else about Jesus that counterbalanced his authority. 
And that was that he was constantly using his authority to set people free. You see, we hate it when people act like they're in charge because they're always building themselves up, right? But King Jesus isn't looking to bolster his position. He's using his authority to bolster the positions of others. And we see this with the demon-possessed man. Demon-possessed. Now, we live in the 21st century. The idea that there are demons and angels is a little bit tricky for us. We have a hard time with that, and that's because we live in this age of science, and science hates the idea that there could be anything more to life than what can be studied in the lab. And of course, that's because if we can study it in the lab, then we can control it. And we want to be the king of our own lives. We want to control everything about ourselves. This is very much the modern Western consensus. It's normal to us. Actually, it's not the normal way that the whole world works, but it sure is normal to us. But what's interesting about this is that while we tout science as our ultimate authority, there's just this huge amount of passion right now in society being spent towards tearing down injustice. Have you noticed that? It's like everywhere. And so uh, the Me Too movement is all about pointing out that it's not okay that women have been abused and their abusers have gone unpunished. That's not okay. That's wickedness. And uh, it's not okay that from the 1870s till 1996, the Canadian government teams up with the church to take indigenous children away from their parents and educate them in the ways of the West and abuse them in the process. That's just not okay. That's wickedness. But very interestingly, one thing that nobody is saying is that these actions were just to be expected because they're examples of the survival of the fittest. Nobody's saying that. Actually, nobody would just dare espouse that idea. And yet, this is the natural progression of the scientific worldview. So in the scientific worldview, everything that exists is merely the product of atoms bumping into each other. There's no meaning. There's no right or wrong. It's just chance and natural selection, right? That's, that's what evolution's all about. And so if men abuse women, it's not wrong. I mean, we don't like it, but it's not, it's not wrong. It's just the stronger sex taking what they want from the weaker, right? Pretty natural. If the government and the church oppress a people group, it's because we're the winners and they're the losers, and that's what winners do to those people, right? We moved in here, we conquered, we deserve to do this kind of thing to those people. I hope that sounds terrible, because it is. Christians believe that, the, that right and wrong isn't about who is strongest, isn't about who wins, it's about who God is. That's what Christians believe, and so the church should be at the front fighting for justice. The church should always be there. And historically, we see the church many times in that place. Think of Martin Luther King Jr., for example. But interestingly, right now, it's largely secular society that's fighting for justice. Have you noticed that? There's some some big inconsistencies here. And so uh, in science, uh, right and wrong and hate and love, these are just all chemicals in your brain that, that you use to pass on your genes. And so, of course, when when the world attempts to fix injustice, it's it's going to come up short. The church should look at the the world and say, oh my goodness, the world is getting uh, justice wrong. Of course they're getting justice wrong. They've got this skewed idea. They don't have any basis for right and wrong. But friends, there's a call here for the church to stand up and bring the presence of Christ into society. This is our job. We are the light of the world. And so, that means we need to defend the powerless. We need to fight injustice. The church needs to be at the front of that. If you've got a passion for that in your heart, it's because Jesus has put it there. And you need to be exercising that, finding ways to shine the light of Jesus into the world of injustice. And so, in in the worldview of the real Jesus that Mark presents to us, 
Uh, the physical world and the spiritual world are just tied right together. There's no dichotomy. Uh, where does right and wrong come from? Uh, it's very much tied to who God is. The, the, the right and wrong in our physical world is tied to the right and wrong of the spiritual world. And, and Jesus is the authority on, on this world, which is actually one world because he made this place. And it's with this authority that he calls out this demon. Now in the exchange between Jesus and this demon that we get in today's text, or, or demons, so you actually notice there's some plural there, we see some really interesting things. So first of all, you'll notice that the demons start talking first, and they got some questions for Jesus. What do you want with us? Have you come here to destroy us? They're scared. But even more interesting than that, they call Jesus something. They call him the Holy One of God. Now, if you happen to be a Jew in the first century, this would have just triggered something right away. And that's because this is a quote from a very famous passage in Isaiah. And so the demons actually are addressing Jesus by quoting God speaking about himself. Get your head around that. Here's Isaiah 43. This is what Yahweh says. That's Lord with all capital letters. This is what Yahweh says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am Yahweh, your Holy One, Israel's <clears throat> Creator and King. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. In Isaiah, Yahweh is the creator king and redeemer who makes a path through the waters to deliver his people. Creation and exodus together. And this is who the demons think Jesus is. This is what they think he's all about. And they're right. And Jesus tells them to be quiet. Actually, Throughout Mark, we're going to bump into this again and again. Jesus is constantly telling people and demons not to make him known. Just a, a couple of verses down, we're going to get to this next week actually. Uh, Jesus is going to heal a man with leprosy and he's going to send him away with this strong warning. Don't tell anyone about this. Instead, go to the priest and let him examine you. This is a bit of a mind bender. We're going to get into it in more detail, but, but wouldn't it be, be helpful, uh, you know, for publicity wise, for people to know what Jesus had done? You're doing all these great things, Jesus. You're, you're going through the effort and the work of actually pulling off some amazing miracles. Shouldn't people know about this, Jesus? Not really. What about the demons? I mean, wouldn't it be helpful if these demons that Jesus was casting out were allowed to complain that Yahweh with skin on was whooping them up? Wouldn't that help your credibility, Jesus? That's what I would do, but Jesus isn't worried that his publicity is suffering. Not, just not at all, right? So it's actually it's all part of his plan. So it's going to take time for us to realize that he's the Messiah. This is, this is amazing. So Jesus knows how the story ends, and so he doesn't need the help of lying demons. So the demons might actually be telling the truth, but demons always lie. Right? And he doesn't need the help of people who have these wrong ideas about him. Throughout Mark, we're going to bump into you know, people who get Jesus a little bit right, say some right stuff, but then obviously have Jesus so wrong. Jesus doesn't need their help to tell his story. Jesus is going to tell his own story. And so Jesus heals this man possessed by this impure spirit, and he makes him clean. This is Jesus' story, and, and Jesus uses his authority to, to elevate the position of this person. He goes from not being allowed in the synagogue, he's, he's defiled and impure, to being welcomed into the presence of God. That's what Jesus does when he interacts with people. That's what he wants to do with you. That's Jesus' story. Our text today ends with one other elevation as Jesus heads to Simon's house. So Simon is Peter. Uh, Jesus gives him a new name a little bit later. But Simon's mother-in-law is sick. And in verse 31 we read this. And so Jesus went to her bedside, took her by the hand, and helped her sit up. Then the fever left her, and she prepared a meal for them. Notice Jesus helped her sit up. Literally, uh, the word in the Greek here is, he raised her up. 
And Mark's going to use this word throughout his gospel almost every time Jesus heals. Not every time, but almost every time. And so Jesus raises up the paralytic and he raises up Jairus' daughter and then he raises up the boy uh, who had an un- unclean spirit. And ultimately, Jesus is going to be raised up after the crucifixion. It's not an accident. This is the reason that people loved Jesus even though he taught with authority. Jesus' authority didn't crush people or oppress people. It raised people up. It resurrected people to the life that they were designed to enjoy in the beginning. That's awesome. Isn't that incredible? Wouldn't that be amazing to be around Jesus? We see some amazing stuff happen to people who are around Jesus as he's raising them up. And so we see this with Simon's mother-in-law. And so she gets healed. And it's really interesting to me. Uh, Who knows how long she's been out. But, you know, a mom's got a lot of stuff to get done, right? In the house, there's stuff that probably hasn't been done. Peter hasn't been doing it. He hasn't been picking up his socks, right? But here's this amazing thing. She doesn't get up after being healed and get on with all the stuff that she wanted to do but couldn't because she was sick. Doesn't do that. No, instead she starts to serve Jesus. And she does this because she's, she can now. She's free to. She wasn't free to do it before. Her sickness was oppressing her but now she's free. And the moment she's no longer impaired by illness, she enters life in Jesus' kingdom. This is what happens when Jesus raises you up. You enter life in his kingdom. And this is what Jesus' freedom leads to. Freedom for Jesus isn't about being able to do whatever you want. No, uh, doing what you want, doing what I want, doesn't lead to freedom. It leads to slavery. But freedom in Jesus' kingdom is about having your desires changed so that you want to live in a way that brings glory to God. That's freedom then. You're not doing it because you have to. You're doing it because you want to, but there's been this transition right inside of you. Do you feel that inside yourself? Do you want to do some things now that you didn't used to want to do? Do you see areas in your life where you want to want to do things differently? Jesus' kingdom is breaking in. And here's where the Lord of the Sabbath, our Creator and the Redeemer King, brings all of this together. And so it's when we want to, when we encounter Jesus and then when we want what God wants for us, that we find ourselves in ultimate happiness. This is what Jesus' kingdom is all about. Jesus is about redeeming people who are trapped in slavery to sin and trapped in slavery to legalism and and leading us up out of this old life and into the abundant life that he designed us to enjoy in the beginning. That's what Jesus wants for you. And the question Mark wants us to ask is, will we kneel before our Creator and Redeemer? Will you kneel? Will you submit your life to Jesus' will? If you will, then he'll open a way through the waters and lead you up out of your Egypt. He'll deliver you out of what is oppressing you. He'll raise you up to the freedom and bring you into the restful relationship with God that you were created to have in the beginning. So will you submit to Jesus' ruling authority? Heavenly Father, we come before you today and uh, we acknowledge first and foremost that we are a rebellious people, that we constantly are are turning away like sheep to, to live our own way. We like to be kings in our own life and we acknowledge, Jesus, that as we do what we want to do, it always results in slavery and bondage, not the freedom that we set out thinking it's going to accomplish. But Jesus We recognize that you are the creator king and you're our redeemer. And you want good things for us. And we thank you so much for this. And we ask now that you would come and that you'd shine into us. Shine your love and your light into us afresh. And give us a desire to respond, to live in a way that brings you glory. I pray this would show up in ways that we Sabbath. That even right now we'd be thinking about the things that we do 
on a weekly basis that bring us back, that point us back towards you as our creator and redeemer. And I pray that you'd even bring things to mind, even right now, that we could do differently that would cause us to better image you uh, to ourselves, that we might grow in godliness, and that we might shine your light out into the world. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Bless you guys. Have an awesome week.